Good day, everyone. It's good to be together again, and I want to share God's word with you today. I'm just excited for the word God has put in my heart, and I want to talk to you today about a generous lifestyle. And I know embracing this thing called generosity, embracing a generous lifestyle is difficult at times because it kind of goes against what we naturally do. I know we're even skeptical. Really, if we're honest, we're skeptical about somebody talking about generosity and and giving. And and immediately we wonder, oh, I wonder what's the angle. I wonder what he wants this time. And so I just want to start off. I want to put your mind at ease and I want to say to you, relax, relax. I don't want anything from you nor the church. And so I just simply want to talk to us today, to yourself and to myself, and I want to encourage us to embrace a generous lifestyle, which I really believe is more in line with a Christ-like lifestyle. You know, I think when uh, we all came into the world, we came in with a selfish spirit on the inside. And if you don't really believe that, all you've got to do again is just look at a couple of toddlers playing on the carpet with their toys and and they can be so peaceful and they're having a great time and everything but it's just a matter of time and you're gonna hear one of them say mine and as a parent when you hear that word you better jump up and you better go because that situation is going to escalate there's no question about that and so my point simply is that every single one of us we come into the world with that kind of spirit, but we don't have to go out of the world with the same kind of spirit because God wants to change us and he wants to do something on the inside. And so if you'll allow me, let me quickly share my story with you. I used to be a very selfish person uh, growing up and at the time I didn't notice it. I didn't realize it. And so for me, it was just, it, it was normal was natural. Surely this is what everybody does. You know, you've got to to fend for yourself. You've got to look after yourself. And my stuff is my stuff. It's nobody else's stuff. It's my stuff. Until one day I remember, and I clearly remember where this happened. My father spoke to me in his study, and I remember exactly where we were. And he pointed this out very lovingly and very kind and gracious, but he pointed this out. And then he told me the story about the open hand. And the closed hand. And he said, you know, when you live with an open hand, he said, God can can always put back into that hand. When you live with an openness to help others and to bless others, God can put back into your hand. He says, but when you live with a closed hand, God can't put anything in that hand. God can't put anything in in a clenched fist. And then he said something that really got my attention. He said to me, Leonard, unless you change this thing, it's going to affect the rest of your life. It's going to mess up your life. It's going to mess up your relationships. And then he went on to say, he said, only you can change it. Well, you see, up until that point, I wasn't even aware of it. And I can honestly say it was just a, a blind spot in my life. But from that moment on, I started becoming more and more aware of this thing in my life. And I started realizing that maybe there was some truth in what he was saying. And then I started noticing other selfish people and how ugly it was. Then I realized that same ugliness was in me. And there came a point in my life, I don't know if it was a couple of weeks after that incident or maybe a month or two, I'm not sure, But there came a point in my life where I made a decision, I'm going to change this thing in my life. I'm determined to pursue a gracious lifestyle. I'm on a mission to change this. And I can honestly say to you, I've been on a mission ever since because that's something that I just didn't see at the time. And so I want to encourage the parents today. Your kids are like clay in your hands. You can help them and mold them and make them. Don't overlook the ugliness or the selfishness or the bad habits. 
You know, I've even heard parents say, oh, you know, it's just the way he is. You know, he's my selfish child, you know. He's never going to change. Or, you know, she's just lazy. You know, she never wants to help, and she's never going to change. Or, you know, he's just the shy one. You know, he never greets anybody. It's not going to change. No, 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 no. Help them for their sake And for everybody else, it's like, do what my father did. Just speaking the truth in love and pointing out a blind spot area that maybe they're not even aware of. But you see, just because we come into the world with certain habits and certain traits doesn't mean that we've got to go out of the world with those same bad habits. Now, let me quickly read a story to you here from John chapter 12 and It's a story where Jesus goes to visit Lazarus, one of his friends. His two sisters, Mary and Martha, are around there as well. And listen to what it says in verse 1. Six days before the Passover celebration began, Jesus arrived at Bethany, the home of Lazarus, the man he had raised from the dead. A dinner was prepared in Jesus' honor. Martha served, and Lazarus was among those who ate with him. Then Mary took a 12-ounce jar of expensive perfume made from essence of nard, and she anointed Jesus' feet with it, wiping his feet with her hair. And The house was filled with a fragrance. But Judas Iscariot, the disciple who would soon betray him, said, This perfume was worth a year's wages. It should have been sold and the money given to the poor. Now, on face value, this guy's got a good point. He's saying it's very expensive. We could have used this for the poor. But the Bible says in verse 6, listen to this, not that he cared for the poor. So what is his point? What is he on about? Well, the Bible's going to tell us now. He was a thief. And since he was in charge of the disciples' money, you see, he was carrying the wallet or the money bag. Since he was in charge of the disciples' money, he often stole some for himself. All right, now let's look at the story quickly. In the story, you find three main characters, Jesus, Judas, and Mary. One of those characters represent you and me, and I think it's fair to say that it's probably not Jesus. All right, so that leaves us with Judas And Mary, so who are we most like, Judas or Mary? And I think most of us, all of us, probably instinctively, doesn't matter whether we're male or female, we go with Mary. I'd rather be Mary. I don't want to be Judas. I'm not that snake. There wouldn't be nothing like him. Because you see, these two characters had two very different spirits. Judas had a selfish spirit. Mary had a very generous spirit. Where does selfishness come from? Selfishness comes from Satan himself. How do we know that? Isaiah 14, Satan says, I will ascend to the heaven and I will be like him. So what is he doing? He's exalting himself. It's all about me and myself and I. And so that's where selfishness comes from. It comes from Satan himself. Generosity, on the other hand, comes from God. It's easy to remember it. Generosity comes from God. And so these two two spirits are opposing, and you and I fall into one of those two categories. And so we're going to see in a couple of moments, which one is it? But just be warned. Let me give it to you up front. When you and I make up our mind that We want to lean toward generosity. We want to live with an open hand. I want to develop this in my life. You're going to be criticized. Just like Mary was criticized because you see the moment she started anointing Jesus' feet, Judas criticizes her. And I've experienced that and maybe you've experienced that, that you're good to somebody else and you bless somebody else. And then from the sidelines, You have somebody criticizing. Who does he think he is? Does he think he's a Rockefeller or something? No, he's actually, he's the other fellow. He's one of God's fellows. And so that's what Judas was doing. The Bible tells us Judas was a thief. In verse 6 it says, 
He was taking some of that money for himself. He was carrying the money back, helping himself do it from time to time. But he wasn't only a thief. He was also a greedy person. He's the guy that sold Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. And so here's a guy who's a thief and a greedy person, and yet he has the nerve to criticize Mary for being generous. But you see, this is what I want you to see today. That's what selfish people do. It doesn't matter what's happening in their own lives. But you see, they criticize others because it's almost like that's the oldest cover-up in the book. That's the oldest trick in the book. Now, not only do they criticize, but they also come up with excuses why they can't be generous. And so you'll find selfish people criticize, and selfish people, oh, they great with excuses. And so they look at somebody who has a need. I can't meet that need. Yeah, what difference is my 100 rand going to make? What difference is my 1,000 rand going to make? It will never plug the gap. Now, maybe it won't, but it will make a difference. There's no doubt about it. Firstly, it will show them that somebody cares. And I think more importantly, it'll show them that God cares. Because you see, God uses people sometimes to show that he cares to help. God, even in the Bible, used birds. Remember the ravens feeding Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 17. God has used rats in a prison to feed a pastor, bringing in apples every day. I mean, why wouldn't that rat eat that apple himself? Because he'd been told by the creator of the universe to go and feed, to go and care for somebody else. And so when you and I bless somebody, when we help somebody, it shows them that God cares. You know, just the other day I spoke to a single mother who had just recently lost her job, and she was so concerned. She didn't know how she was going to put food on the table and pay the bills. Just out of the blue, a friend blessed her with a thousand rand. And then another friend came and, and blessed them with enough groceries for the entire month. It blew her away. She said to me, she said, you know, I just realized that there are really people who care. And then she said, and it showed me that God cares. You see, that's what happens. But selfish people, oh no, they've got all the excuses why they can't help. Here's another excuse. So they'll look at a need and they'll say, no, you know what, I, I can't fully meet that need. Well, you don't have to fully meet the need. Just do what you can. Then sometimes what happens is they look at a need and they look at all the needs around about them and all the people and they say, what's the use? I can't help everybody. <laughs> Can you imagine if everyone who had something to give had that kind of attitude stood back and said, I can't help everybody, then nobody would help anybody. And so I think our attitude rather needs to be, let's do something for someone. We can't help everybody, but that's fine. That's fine. Let's do something for someone. Or here's another way to say it. Let's do for one what we wish we could do for everyone. So let's go back to that story do you think that Jesus knew Judas was a thief? Of course Jesus knew. But then why would he give him the money back? Why would he allow him to walk around with the money? Because you see, sometimes God tests us in the area of our weakness. And it's not so that we keep on failing. It's so that somewhere along the line, we pass that test. And our weakness becomes a strength. And so I can honestly say that's what's happened in my life, where I've gone from a weakness. I don't know if it's a strength yet, but I'm moving toward that. I'm determined. I'm on my way. And, and a weakness can eventually become a strength in our lives. And so sometimes God will allow us to go through that testing because he wants to develop us. Now, I realize when things are tough in our own lives and we're battling and, and there are needs and stuff, 
it's so easy for us to think this is not the time to give. This is not the time to to help anybody. And so what happens is we tend to look after ourselves. It's called self-preservation. The problem is it's rooted in self. Or can I say selfishness? Do you know during World War II, history shows us that the prisoners of war who looked after themselves and just cared for themselves, many of them didn't make it. But the prisoners who looked after others and helped others and shared some of their food, many of those prisoners made it in the long run. You see, sometimes we've got to sow a seed in our time of need. We've got to sow a seed in our time of need. As we went into the lockdown, a friend of mine was sharing with me how they had just lost a, a 10 million rand deal. They had the goods ready, ready to export. Everything was lined up. And the next moment, of course, the ports and everything closed. And so they weren't able to export it. And so they were in contact with the customer and the customer on the other side, man, he desperately needed it. And so he wasn't prepared to wait. He couldn't really wait. And so he was forced to cancel the deal. This friend of mine, he said, look, I understand. They had to go somewhere else. They had to source it from somewhere else. But he said, it's no use crying over it. He says, look, I ain't losing a 10 million rand deal. It's a massive deal. He says, we really needed it. He says, but what can I do? It's no use crying over it. It is what it is. We're going to trust God for another deal down the line. It put them in a position they couldn't, during the lockdown, draw a salary at all. So they had nothing. They didn't have a 50% income. They had nothing. Then to make matters worse, he started noticing that some of his family members were battling, were in a worse situation than what he was in. It was easy for him to think, you know, I can't help them at the moment. You know, I, I haven't even taken a salary. You know, it, this is a bad time. But he decided to help in any case. What was he doing? He was sowing a seed in his time of need. You know, just the other day I was chatting to him. He said, you know what happened? He says, I've just landed two deals. And together their value is 10 million rand. You see, the Bible says in Luke 6, 38, it says, give and it will be given. When you sow a seed, there's a harvest coming. It's just a matter of time because that's what the Bible says. And so sometimes, sometimes we've got to just do that. Even though we look at our situation, sometimes we think, but you know, my circumstances just aren't good. It's not the right time. Things aren't. We're waiting for the perfect time to give. Listen, friends, if we're waiting for the perfect time, the perfect circumstances to give, we'll never give. And so we've got to learn. Sometimes we've got to give. We've got to sow a seed in our time of need. Or we've got to give even when it hurts. And so Liesl and myself and many of our pastors, we've been helping people personally. We've been helping people during this time. And we haven't been able to do certain things. It's limited us. We've had to be careful financially because we've helped other people. But I don't want it any other way. Because you see, what are we doing? We're sowing a seed in our time of need. Now, I want to show you quickly from Genesis chapter 26 how Isaac sowed in a time of famine. Genesis 26 talks about a time when there was a great famine in the land and there'd been a drought for many years and people were really battling. And God spoke to him. God told him to take a step of faith and to sow a seed in any case, to start sowing in that famine. Now listen to what it says here in Genesis 26 verse 1. It says, and there was a famine in the land. So in other words, the conditions aren't perfect. This is not a good time to sow. Not a good time. Now listen to verse 12. It says, then Isaac sowed in that land. So he went ahead. He obeyed God. He sowed in the land and received in the same year a hundredfold 
and the Lord blessed them. I want you to notice, he stepped out in obedience to God, even though his circumstances weren't great. He went ahead anyway, and he did it. And what happened? God blessed him. You see, that's what happens when we walk in obedience to God, when we either we listen to his word where he tells us to bless and to sow and to love and to help, when we're obedient to his word, or sometimes God speaks to us deep down in here, when we walk in obedience, when we step out and do what God's told us to do, even though it may seem like it's not a good time, God honors that and God blesses that. You see, here's the thing. The power is not in the seed. The power is in the obedience. You can have a bag full of seed and you're walking around with that seed and you're putting it down here and you're putting it down the table over there. Nothing is going to happen with that seed. You've got to do something with the seed. You see, the power is in the doing in the obedience. Listen to Psalm 41. It says, blessed is he who considers the poor. Another translation says, who is kind to the poor. So in other words, he's doing something for the poor. It says that person, that generous person is blessed. It says the Lord will deliver him. It's referring to the generous person in time of trouble. So when he goes through trouble, you'll have God on your side. That's what it's saying. And the Lord will preserve him and keep him alive and he will be blessed on the earth. And so when God lays someone on your heart to encourage them, to make a phone call, just chat to them and lift their spirit, or to help them or to bless them, when God lays that on your heart, the best thing you can do, just be obedient. Do what God is prompting you to do because there's blessing coming. And sometimes God is testing us and he wants to see, are we going to focus on ourselves and my needs, my frustrations, what's happening in my life and my family? Or are we going to raise our eyes a little bit and look at the people around about us? Blessed is he who considers the poor. Now, let me share the last story quickly with you from Mark chapter 12. And this is a strange little story. And I say it's a strange little story because it's only four little verses in the Bible. Sometimes we look at the story, we're not sure. How did that little story make it into the Bible? Four little verses. You see, it's a story about a woman who did something. And at the time, it seemed so insignificant. What's the big deal? And so most people just overlooked it, never even realized what was happening. But Jesus saw it. And Jesus took note, and that story is in the Bible for us today. It made it into the Bible, and we're still talking about that story 2,000 years later because there's a powerful, powerful lesson in the story. And so this is what happened. Jesus and his disciples were in the temple, and so they're sitting in a place where they can watch the money boxes. And they're sitting there, and they're watching people come in and dropping money in all the time. And I'm sure the disciples were pretty bored because, come on, let's go and do something. Let's go and, you know, we'll see some miracles and raise some dead people and stuff like that. And and here they're sitting. They're just watching. There's no Wi-Fi even in this place, you know, and so they're really bored. But Jesus stuck it out because there's a lesson that he wanted them to learn. And so this is what happened. These money boxes were in the front in the temple. And on top of the money box, uh, history tells us that they had these big brass sort of funnels or like a, like a lily almost, or you could even say like an upside down trumpet. And people would come and pour in their money. And the Bible says the rich people were putting in a lot of money. And so you didn't have to go and watch and see how much they're putting in. You just had to sit there and listen. And you would hear the money clanging down that, that trumpet and falling into the box. I mean, these rich people were really making a little bit of a song and a dance of it. They were, they were showing off, really. And that's where we get the expression, blowing your own trumpet. That expression comes from two things. It comes from the trumpet there on the money box. 
And it also comes from medieval times, and this is not important, I'm just mentioning it. It comes from medieval times where a wealthy person would, when he traveled, he would send a herald up front with a trumpet. And as they entered a village or a little town or even a city or something like that, he would blow the trumpet and get people's attention. And people would come and he would tell some stories about the greatness of this person. And so we get that expression from those two things, from blowing their own trumpet, entering from the herald doing that, but also on the trumpet on the money boxes and and the temple. And so the wealthy people would do that. They would come and they would literally pour money. And it was almost like a slot machine hitting the jackpot. I mean, everybody would hear, whoa, what's happening there because of that? Then something happened. Listen to verse 42. Then a poor widow came and dropped in two small coins. And it went unnoticed. There's this noise of the rich people dropping a lot of money. And there's no doubt some talking and stuff like that busy happening. And then this poor widow comes and she drops in two little coins. And they drop into the box with hardly a sound. Nobody notices Jesus, Jesus did. And Jesus called these disciples to him and said, it's almost like he says, boys, 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 give me your attention. You've missed this now. You've missed it. He says to them, I tell you the truth. This poor widow, he says, you see that widow over there? This poor widow has given more than all the others who are making contributions. And I'm sure they're looking and they're thinking, What? We didn't even hear her put in it. How can he say that? And then he clarifies it in the next verse, verse 44. He says, for they gave a tiny part of their surplus. They've got a lot. They've given a little. That's what he's saying. They've got a lot. They've given a little. They've given a tiny part of their surplus. But she, poor she is, has given everything she had to live on. Listen, friends, the most generous people don't necessarily give the biggest amount or the biggest gift. The most generous givers don't always give the biggest gift. Because you see, God measures generosity very differently to how we measure it. You know, when we look at it, we look at the portion of what someone gives When God looks at it, he looks at the proportion of what someone gives. And so here's the lesson to the story. You don't have to be rich to be generous. And you don't have to give a lot to be generous. Just give what you have. Just give what you have. Whether it's time, talent, or treasure. Sometimes we need to give our time just calling somebody, just spending time, just visiting somebody who's lonely, spending time with them. Other times, it's the talent that we have. God has given you a talent or an ability, and you can use that to help somebody else. Sometimes it is our treasure. Sometimes it is money that we need to give, but we need to give what we have. You know, I love the thought that we can be generous with our words, that we can bless people with our our words. And it may be somebody at the supermarket, it may be somebody in a restaurant serving you, it may be somebody working for you, it may even be one of your children, but do you know that our words can make all the difference in their lives? It can be such a blessing to them. And I'm not talking about flattery. I'm talking about sharing something, sharing what God thinks about them. How do I know what God thinks? Well, God loves them. So much so that he has sent heaven's best for them. God wants the best. God wants all men to be saved. That's what the Bible says. That's how much he loves them. And the Bible also says that he's got good plans for us. So we know what God's heart is toward people. So all we need to do is just to start sharing that. Just sharing some love and kindness and and generosity with them. And sometimes 
We can do that through our words. It's incredible what our words can do. So why am I sharing this with you today? You see, the Bible says he gives seed to the sower. And if we're not going to sow, no reason for God to give us seed. God blesses a generous man, a generous woman. If we're not generous, there's no reason for God to bless us in that area. So there's no doubt in my mind that part of our blessing, I'm not saying all of God's blessings upon us, but part of our blessing is dependent upon how much we give if we live with an open hand or a closed hand because scripture teaches us that everything we have comes from him in any case 1 Chronicles 29 everything you and I have and some of what God has given us is for ourselves but some of it is not for us it's for others let me put it another way some of it is to eat and some of it is seed think about a farmer if a farmer has a harvest and then he takes all of that seed and he uses that over the next season to just between him and his family and they just eat it all he'll have no seed for the next season no farmer in his right mind would do that he's got to make sure that he has seed for that next season because his harvest is going to depend on that. And so I'm asking you today, whatever you do, don't eat all of your seed because you see tomorrow's harvest is determined by today's seed. Tomorrow's harvest is determined by today's seed. And so I want to pray for us before I do, let me just say to you, if you've been a little bit uncomfortable during this talk, I'm sorry, I really am. I didn't intend that at all. But let me just say this. Generous people don't get uncomfortable during a talk like this. They don't. It stirs them. It fuels them. It awakens something on the inside where they say, God, I want to break that selfishness in me completely. That selfish spirit. I don't want that. I don't want a Judas spirit. I want what Mary had. God help me to live open handed. And that's the prayer that we're going to pray today. I'm telling you up front. A short prayer. A simple prayer. But that's what I'm going to ask for. For me and for you. So join me as we pray together. Father God. Thank you for all your blessings. Thank you that we know everything we have comes from you. The very air we breathe, the energy we have, our health, our finances, everything comes from you. If it wasn't for you, we wouldn't have it. Now, Lord, help us to be faithful stewards. Help us, Lord, to be sensitive to your prompting when you prompt us, when we sense on the inside to help, to call somebody, to encourage others, to bless them. Just make us sensitive to, number one, to recognize it, but then to obey that and to do what Isaac did. doesn't matter what our circumstances look like, Lord. We want to walk in obedience to you because we know, somehow we just know, when we do that, that's when you're going to provide all of our needs according to your riches in Christ Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Bless you.